Hey everyone, hope you've had a great week. We're gonna um, do our compilation video today talking about estrogen. Um, you know, we did everything with our stories and so we're gonna throw everything together today. Now this has been a really important week um, in terms of kind of estrogen therapy. A new study kind of came out that really demonstrated once and for all that there is not an increase in the risk of breast cancer when in relation to estrogen therapy. And this has been something that's been thrown out you know, for, for many years since the Women's Health Initiative came out in the late 1990s or actually early 2000s, um, in which they said, you know, it kind of leaked to the media that, oh my gosh, there was this increase of breast cancer with hormone therapy and so no one can do hormone therapy and it's a horrible thing and, and really that's a completely false statement. When you look into the data with that, you saw that it actually wasn't related to the estrogen at all. It was a slight increase, um, an extra one out of every thousand women per year would develop breast cancer um, with if they use a specific type of combined estrogen and progesterone medication. And they found that it was related to the progesterone type, not the estrogen type. So for people that are on estrogen therapy, you can rest assured that that is not increasing your chance of breast cancer. So um, remember that um, estrogen um, is, or estrogens is a hormone family. We have four main types of estrogens. You have estrone, which is kind of the estrogen of menopause, estradiol, which is kind of like the reproductive estrogen. It's the most potent type the body produces. Then you have estriol, which is really only found in pregnancy, and estetrol, which is really kind of more of a uh, estrogen byproduct, if you will, not a real a lot of use for that at this current time. Um, now, like all sex hormones, this is um, originally produced from cholesterol, um, and so for that reason, oral estradiol, especially in terms of hormone therapy, um, is something you always have to be careful with if you have a patient that has really high cholesterol levels because it can raise that cholesterol um, if she's uh, taking it by mouth. Um, so, you know, there's a whole steroid pathway, and I may talk about this at some time in the future, um, but basically it kind of shows you how everything kind of breaks down. But really, when we see estrogens kind of, and people always ask, okay, well, you know, I think I'm, I'm having hormonal symptoms. You know, I always say, well, what are your symptoms? And they kind of go through this list of stuff. And so I think it's important to break down kind of what estrogens do in the body, like what um, kind of, you know, organs they affect and things along those lines. So starting kind of from the head and working the way down, the brain has quite a number of estrogen receptors in it. And this contributes a lot of times to a lot of the mood issues that we see kind of around menstruation. So a lot of the perimenstrual mood disorders are due to a drop in estradiol levels. This is also why postpartum depression can develop. You know, with uh, after pregnancy, estradiol levels drop uh, drastically. Um, and so these estrogen receptors that were very filled and, and very full now are kind of depleted and they're kind of coming out saying, oh my gosh, you know, I need more estrogen. And, and so it causes all sorts of issues. Um, for patients that have catamenial epilepsy, which are seizures kind of related to either ovulation or to menstruation, once again, that drop in, uh, in estradiol that occurs in both of those instances is what triggers that seizure activity. So the brain is very rich in estrogen receptors. Your skin has quite a number of estrogen receptors in it. Um, this is why, you know, in menopausal patients, we will see sometimes a significant, you know, um, kind of sagging of skin or some thinning of skin. You'll see kind of their skin becomes a lot more crepe-like um, and thin. Um, hair has some estrogen receptors in it. Um, you know, muscle, eh, some, not really too much, but we do know that kind of low estradiol levels are associated with a lot of joint and muscle pain. So really it's more of a connective tissue type uh, manifestation. Obviously, breast tissue is very rich in estrogen um, receptors. This is why, you know, with puberty, as estradiol levels go up, um, you see an increase in breast, uh, you know, development uh, and the glandular development within the breast itself. Now, typically, um, estrogen-related breast pain centers more around the areola and the nipple, not necessarily the periphery of the breast. That tends to be more of a progesterone effect. Although you can get some, you know, kind of just generalized breast discomfort with high estradiol levels. Um, in terms of, you know, other kind of internal organ functions, you're going to see a little bit of stuff with estradiol. Um, we do know that estradiol levels um, are very important when it comes to how fat is deposited in the body. And typically in higher estradiol um, states, you'll see more kind of what's called superficial fat deposition. So in like the breast or the buttocks or things like that. 
And then in lower estradiol states, you tend to see more fat deposited around the midsection. And this is why kind of with that menopausal transition, um, we'll see a lot of times uh, patients complain and say, you know, I'm gaining weight and it's all going straight to my straight to my abdomen. They're getting kind of, you know, that, that just abdominal fat that is very difficult to lose. And this is because it's transitioned from that superficial, easy to remove, um, you know, fat to a more visceral, uh, deeper fat. Um, Obviously, in terms of reproductive function, estradiol has tons and tons and tons of uses. Um, you know, I did that whole video on the menstrual cycle. You can check that out. Um, but basically, um, in terms of actual reproductive structures, estradiol is incredibly important for um, the proliferation of endometrial tissue. So for the lining of the uterus to kind of grow and become a great um, repository, if you will, for an embryo or for a place for an embryo to implant. Um, the vaginal um, walls are also very rich in what are called superficial cells in high estrogenic states. Superficial cells are what allow the vagina to stretch. It allows it to kind of accommodate childbirth. It allows the um, um, mucosal producing glands there to work very well to aid with vaginal lubrication, with sexual functioning and other things. Um, and that kind of the uh, tissue presence is seen not only in the vagina, but also in the vestibule and the vulva as well, um, as all of those tissues have a high number of estradiol or just estrogen and total receptors. Um, and so in low estrogenic states, you'll see that tissue kind of flatten out. You'll see it start to retract. You can have some narrowing um, of, for instance, the va vaginal opening. Um, and, you know, it changes also the chemical composition. A high estrogenic state promotes the development or the growth of a type of of bacteria called lactobacillus. Lactobacillus produces lactic acid and that acidity level causes the vagina to be a naturally acidic environment and that keeps bad bacteria and yeast at bay. So obviously if you kind of rate, if you get rid of the estrogen, those lactobacilli go away, the chemical level in the vagina becomes less acidic and more neutral and that allows those yeast and those bad bacteria to grow, which is why in postmenopausal patients who have genital urinary syndrome of menopause, you can see a higher rate of the development of chronic uh, bacterial vaginosis, yeast infection. Um, and this also uh, applies to the tissue around the urethra as well. That becomes more thinned out and more easy for bad bacteria to go up the, to the urethra and have uh, or cause a urinary tract infection. So yeah. So tons of stuff with estrogen in the body. It's incredibly, incredibly important. Um, in reproductive age uh, patients, the ovary or who have ovaries, the ovaries are the main producers of estrogen, um, but you also can get some estrogen produced from the adrenal glands. This is mostly how uh, people with testicles will produce their uh, amounts of estrogen. Um, but also testosterone in high amounts um, can get converted through this um, specific chemical reaction into estrogen too. And this is why sometimes you'll see if a, you know, a guy is doing testosterone supplementation, he's doing, you know, like he may start to have gynecomastia, which is a development of breast tissue in men. Um, and that's because that testosterone is being converted into estrogen. So yeah, so lots of stuff there. Um, in terms of therapy, remember we divide this into basically systemic estradiol therapy and then local or vaginal estradiol therapy. Systemic therapy, you know, any type of hormonal or combined hormonal contraception, so a birth control pill, birth control patch, the NuvaRing, the Anavera ring, anything that is a combined hormonal medication um, that's affecting reproductive function is going to have some type of estrogen with it. It's typically going to be a form of estradiol and usually a, an ethanol estradiol, which is a specific subtype. Um, you know, like I was kind of alluding to in the intro here, there's been a lot of misinformation about estrogen and, and you know, systemic use and how it can cause breast cancer and how it's bad for you. And like I said, now we can definitively say that's not the case. We've been saying it for a little while, but now we can really say that's not the case. Now what estradiol levels, especially in high amounts can do is increase your likelihood for developing blood clots. So this is why we see patients who are on, you know, birth control pills have a higher rate of developing blood clots or pregnant patients have a higher rate of developing blood clots. And so oral estradiol intake um, in terms of hormone therapy um, can increase that risk of blood clots too. And so that's why if you have had a stroke or you've had a heart attack or you've had a deep vein thrombosis that's not related to like a trauma, you know, a, a systemic estrogen, um, is especially an oral systemic estrogen, is not a good choice for you. Now a transdermal, 
that's a bit of contention there. You know, you could say maybe, maybe not. That's really your mileage may vary and definitely something to talk with your kind of specialist about in that. But really the kind of general rule is, you know, probably stay away from that. Now for postmenopausal patients or patients who have uh, POI, primary ovarian insufficiency, um, you know, we're talking about systemic estradiol therapy <clears throat> to help with things like hot flashes, night sweats, um, cognitive changes, you know, that kind of brain fog that goes on, um, you know, mood swings, um, but also to help um, predict or prevent osteoporosis or osteopenia, which is kind of brittle bone issues. Um, and patients who go, the earlier you go through menopause, the more likely you are to develop kind of those um, kind of bone related issues. So definitely if you have POI and you're not on some form of systemic um, estrogen therapy, you really need to do that because like I said, it's, you're at a higher risk for getting osteoporosis later in life. Um, other things that you know will um, sometimes use systemic estradiol therapy for would be um, patients that have really severe uh, menstrual related mood disorders or especially um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Now remember I said that that kind of drop in estradiol that occurs before the onset of menstruation triggers a lot of these emotional changes. So for patients that have severe menstrual related mood disorders, sometimes supplementing their estradiol in the latter half of their cycle or what's called the luteal phase can be a good option for them to help kind of mitigate some of those symptoms. Same for catamenial epilepsy or any of these things that are related to those low estrogen states, you know, um, menstrual migraines, that's another one that we kind of see with this. So, um, but, you know, the big thing obviously is to kind of work with your provider and know that, you know, medicine is not a one size fits all type thing. Everyone is different. Algorithmic medicine, which I know, uh, you know, a lot of places uh, practice is, is a, a bane to the individual patient. It's great for looking at things like overall health prevention and treating the masses and whatever, but you are not the mass, you are you. And so your issues may not fit that textbook, you know, list of symptoms. And that's the thing that I see a lot of times kind of being more of a specialty gynecology provider. These patients come in and they say, well, you know, I have this and this and this and this. And I've been told, well, it's not that because I don't have that symptom or it's not this because I don't have this symptom, but all of the symptoms that they are having point towards that. So you really have to look at, it's a, it's a gestalt. You're looking at everything together, not just, you know, oh, this symptom and this symptom and this, you know, blah, drives me nuts. So anyway, sorry, soapbox done for now. Um, Vaginal estrogen therapy, on the other hand, is just a local effect. Now, I will say we have one vaginal medication for um, hormone therapy for postmenopausal patients, and we have two vaginal medications for premenopausal patients um, that have systemic effect. So, and that would be the Nuva Ring and the Anovera, which are both combined contraceptive uh, vaginal rings. Um, and the uh, uh, Nuva Ring lasts for a month at a time, the Anavera lasts for a year at a time. Um, and those are inserted into the vagina and then they secrete hormones and enough strength to kind of provide systemic effect. And then the Fem Ring um, is a uh, type of hormone therapy, um, or so a systemic estradiol therapy um, for menopausal patients is in inserted vaginally, and it provides both systemic and local effect um, and it uh, is great for three months. So it works for three months. So it's a fantastic type of medication. Good, you know, insurance doesn't like to cover it because they're stupid. Uh, see previous insurance video for my talk on that. Um, but it, um, it's a great medication. So aside from those, you know, friends, um, there's one other non-vaginal uh, medication that provides just a vaginal effect, and that is ospimifene or osfina. That is an oral pill. It's technically what's called a SERM or a selective estrogen reuptake modulator. What that does, it means it kind of downgrades or suppresses estrogen receptors in certain areas and it upregulates them in other areas. And in this case, it's upregulating the estrogen receptors in the vaginal tissue. So for patients who have, um, you know, uh, vulvovaginal atrophy or uh, postmenopausal or uh, genital urinary syndrome menopause, Osfina can be a great option if they don't want to do any type of vaginal preparation. And it's on Medicare Part D here in the United States. So whippity do, you know, now insurance companies, that's once again, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna even gonna go down that path again. But anyway, it, it's there. And if you have Medicare, you should get covered for it because it's one of their preferred medications. But anyway, 
Other vaginal preparations, uh, the main thing we're looking at kind of is, you know, how are you going to dose this medication? Are you going to use a cream? Creams have probably been around the longest. Um, one of the first types of vaginal creams is a medication called Primarin. Primarin is also a, an oral systemic pill. Um, it's made from the, um, you get conjugated equine estrogen. So this is a synthetic estrogen that is made basically from pregnant horse urine. Um, and they kind of titrate it down and everything. And so it can either be used as a cream vaginally which for just vaginal effect or systemically um, via a pill. Um, uh, there are other vaginal um, creams as well um, that um, you know uh, work just like I said without local activity. There's vaginal tablets, vaginal suppositories. Um, the, the two kind of newest, if you will, vaginal medications are a medication called Invexi, which is using a micronized estradiol, so a very micro dosing of that. That's a vaginal, uh, looks, I don't want to say it's a suppository because it looks like a little capsule. So um, it kind of falls in that. And then there's Interosa, which, um, you know, I've talked about a little bit before. I'll probably talk about Interosa in detail here because it's a form of DHEA and it's a, fant a fantastic medication. It's probably one of my fa favorite uh, vaginal medications. Um, and it breaks down into both estrogens and androgens like testosterone for patients who have uh, vest hormonal vestibulitis. Um, but once again, you're just going to get that systemic effect from that medication. There is also a um, vaginal ring called an S-string, um, and it provides just local effect. It's for three months at a time, similar to the FEM ring, but no systemic effect. Um, and, um, you know, there's also, like I said, I, I think I already mentioned the little tablets like UvaFEM or just a tablet form of vaginal estradiol. So these are great because they, outside of, you know, undiagnosed vaginal bleeding, there's really no contraindications for them. So like if you've had a stroke, a heart attack, any of those, you know, blood clot related issues, like I just talked about with the systemic therapy, um, you can take the vaginal uh, estrogen without any kind of concern. So um, it, it's fantastic. But like I said here recently, this week, this big news drop of, you know, no real worry about breast cancer um, with systemic estrogen therapy. So you really shouldn't worry about it with vaginal estrogen therapy. So anyway, um, that's kind of my, my deep dive into estrogens. Obviously, if you have any questions, reach out, let me know. Otherwise, have a wonderful weekend and I'll talk to you next week.